first contributor. Uh, I'm also uh, one of the steering committee members for operator framework, the whole project, and I'm a maintainer on operator SDK specifically. Uh, and then you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Vasha. I've been contributing to operator SDK and OLM for the past few years. So yeah, that's about me. I work for Red Hat. Okay, so show of hands, who here has used one of these things? Have you ever written an operator? Have you ever used any piece of the operator framework, SDK, OPM, OLM? Okay. That's I'm always surprised that people actually use their stuff. <laughs> uh, so for those of you who maybe aren't familiar, I did see one or two people who didn't uh, raise their hands. Uh, what is an operator? So an operator is a design pattern for deploying software on top of Kubernetes. It's a, a way to structure a program to run on top of Kubernetes that rather than statically deploying your application, sort of teaches Kubernetes how to fish. Uh, so you're probably familiar with the behavior of some things that are very close to operators if you've ever used Kubernetes, like uh, pod controller. So if you've ever kubectl created a pod, the pod controller is the process that sees that line you write into etcd when you execute that command and actually goes and makes it happen. It makes a Docker container exist somewhere. So an operator then is just sort of reproducing that design pattern with your thing instead of a core Kubernetes resource type. So you're going to create an operator for your thing. You're going to write a CRD that represents its state. And you're going to make a controller that reconciles that state with the actual uh, state on the cluster. Uh, and so operator framework is a collection of tools for making this easier. Uh, we have a variety of tools for scaffolding, uh, deploying, managing, upgrading, distributing, testing, and all kinds of other stuff, uh, these uh, applications. Uh, right, here's just a neat graphic with some of those things. Operator SDK, like I said, is a, a tool for scaffolding them. OPM is a tool for uh, registering them so they can be distributed, and then OLM is like a package manager. Uh, so we'd like to start with uh, sort of an announcement. We've been having this cooking in the works for a couple months now, uh, but Java Operator SDK is officially joining the project as uh, our third federated sub-project. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with Java Operator SDK, uh, they're a team uh, that's been working on a plugin for Operator SDK to generate uh, Java operators as well as the underlying framework. Uh, that that uses. So it's a, a new architecture you can generate operators with, just like we previously had Go, uh, Ansible, and Helm operators. Now you can write them in Java. Uh, and then the sort of equivalent of controller runtime, the framework that allows you to interact with the Kube API from within the operator itself. Uh, all right, and then this is just uh, what I just described. So they, they write the framework, they write the plugin, uh, and we're hoping that this is going to make uh, closer collaboration between them and the Operator SDK team in particular, uh, as well as hoping to garner more contribution from the community because we know uh, a lot of application developers are maybe not the most familiar with Golang if they haven't you know, worked with Kubernetes before. Uh, and Java is a very large, very popular enterprise language, so we're hoping that this will, will drive some more contribution to the project or at least some more use. Uh, so, uh, going down the list of things that we support, build. So, what's been going on in Operator SDK? Uh, so, we've been working on redoing sort of the internal architecture of Operator SDK uh, and Kube Builder, which we're sort of built on top of. Uh, and what we've been doing is we've been so re-architecting uh, it so that rather than import it at like a software library level, we're going to try and import Kube Builder at like a binary level to make things more similar to how like Git plugins work, if you're familiar with those. Uh, and the eventual goal of this is to make third-party uh, plugins for Operator SDK possible. So like rather than having Java Operator SDK compiled into Operator SDK itself, uh, that some third-party author would be able to write you know, some plugin, like a Java library or whatever, uh, and you'd be able to go to their website and download it without having to bug us. Uh, and we're currently in the process of uh, implementing that in Kube Builder and, and redoing things on the operator SDK end to use that. We're hoping to sort of dog food this and turn our own internal plugins, the ones we use right now today for Go, Helm, Ansible, and now Java, uh, to 
sort of dog food this approach so that you know theoretically any, anybody's third party plugin would be just as much of a first class citizen as the the core architectures we support. Uh, and hopefully, that, again, this will drive more contribution because uh, people aren't the most familiar with the languages we do support. Uh, and they'd be able to write their own, roll their own if they want, which we're actually already familiar with at least a couple projects. Uh, one for Python and one, I think, for TypeScript. Uh, <laughs> uh, that might be you know, interested in joining this once this is possible. So that'll be cool. Uh, and then here's some quick links. Uh, if you're interested in any of the things I just talked about, uh, you can download the slides and, and follow these links to uh, look at some of the stuff we've been working on. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Varsha to talk about OLM. Um, now that we heard about how to build operators, let's look into how to manage them. So Operator Framework has come up with a solution called Operator Lifecycle Manager. What does OLM do? OLM helps us in installing, uninstalling, and managing the entire lifecycle of an operator on a cluster. So what's new, which is happening in OLM? We are moving to a new set of APIs and introducing a new version known as OLM v1. But the question comes on why are we doing this? OLM has remained uh, in the Kubernetes scenario for a very long time. Now, the reason for doing this is that the existing APIs which OLM developed kind of were not isolated and kind of fulfilled a lot of purposes, which is not something which we wanted. And due to this, anyone who is new to OLM, uh, when they uh, started onboarding or using the product, it became all the more difficult because of this whole entangled set of complexities which are currently in there. Now, OLM was designed a long time before, uh, at the time when CRDs were still in the beta format. So a lot of our design decisions are not relevant to the current scenarios. And that's the reason it made sense for us to develop a very new architecture based on the learnings which we had on OLM v0 and uh, introduce a new set of APIs. Now, what are those new set of APIs and what can you expect out of them? So OLM will con uh, consist of a focused set of scoped components. To quickly go over them, we have four set of components. One is the operator API, which is uh, brought to us through operator controller. This is going to be the user-facing API wherein the user can define that they want to install uh, XYZ package from x.y.z version and from channel A. And operator API will do it for you. Now inside operator API will have this ruck pack. Uh, the component ruck pack can be called as a custom installer. So its job is to deploy manifests. And we'll talk a little bit more about ruck pack in the coming slides. And then we have this uh, interesting project known as catalog D. Uh, it's the package server. In very simple terms, I would call it as a library, which contains bundles and contents of multiple other operators. The fourth one is a very interesting uh, component, which is known as Depi. Uh, it resolves dependencies. Operator world is always not easy. You have a set of complex dependencies in the sense operator A may depend on operator B and operator C, and they may in turn have a lot of other dependencies in each other. So Depi is a SAT solver, which is going to help us with those. Now, to quickly go over Ruckpack, uh, Ruckpack, as I said before, can be considered as a custom installer. Uh, in simple terms, it's a custom uh, controller or a reconciler. What it does, it reaches out to the data store, which contains all the uh, operator data, operator contents, which are known as bundles in the OLM world. It picks them up. It has this uh, component called provisioner, which is nothing but a reconciler, and it's going to install them on cluster. So we have three different APIs defined here. One is the bundle CRD. It defines the manifests and the operator contents, which need to be present on cluster. The second is the bundle deployment CRD. The bundle deployment in turn points towards the bundle, which needs to be installed at that particular instant of time. And the third one, which I talked about, are the provisioners. So provisioners have this interesting concept where right now uh, in Ruckpack, we have Helm provisioner and we have uh, core v1 plain bundle provisioners. And uh, these provisioners can in turn be swapped. You could build your own reconciler, which knows your own bundle format and can bring up uh, stuff from the uh, data source and install it on cluster. So this brings us uh, to a replaceable uh, component kind of idea, where you could bring your own provisioner, plug it into Ruckpack, and use it uh, with OLM. So this is a very quick example on how the CR would look like. Uh, we have on the left side the bundle deployment, 
and the provisional class name here is the core RACPAC IO plane which is an existing provisioner already built in the repository uh, and as I said this could be changed and uh, this refers to app my bundle and the bundle in turn will contain the manifests which are defined on the right side. So the next component is the catalog D. Uh, just uh, to mention this, it's in a very early stage of development. So we really are looking for inputs on this side. So catalog D is basically a repository, or I would say in simple terms, a library, which contains the operator content that defines the packages and bundles which are required by the operator. Now V1 design currently includes an aggregated server and a persistent storage, which is HCD to serve the FBC content. And we are working towards making them clusters code, but we are open to suggestions on how do you want to go ahead with it. But it will expose two kind of APIs, which are the package level, uh, which in turn expose package level data and the bundle level contents. The next component is DEPI. DEPI, as I said, is a SAT solver. Uh, operators are not easy. So what it does is it takes in constraints and it also takes in the available uh, bundles present in the cluster. It resolves the dependencies and tells us if an operator is installable given the dependencies A, B, and C. And it also tells us is if the operator is installable in terms of uh, the condition where it would not break any other existing operator on the cluster. So a little bit more about how DEPI would work. So for example, as a user, I would say that I want to install package A uh, from channel alpha and uh, it's of the version x.y.c. Now what DEPI does is it converts whatever my requirements are into variables which uh, consist of the required packages which are to be installed. Now things are not easy. My uh, operator x may, depend on op uh, may be dependent on operator y and operator z. And again, operator Y and Z contents need to be available in the data source, which is the catalog source here. Now, DEPI checks in if that content is available in the data source, pulls in the dependencies, and in turn recursively pulls in the other dependencies uh, which the operator may be dependent on, and then applies a set of constraints. So constraints in the sense could be something like out of the available possible solutions, I want a solution where I have GVK uniqueness and package uniqueness. In the sense, I don't want two bundles serving the same GVK content, or I don't want two bundles which belong to the same package. So given all these set of constraints, uh, DEPI would solve and give us a solution set. Now the solution set would tell us if a particular package is installable, what are its requirements, and is um, would that be breaking the other contents in the cluster or not. Now that we have the solution set, uh, Rackpack will in turn go ahead and install the contents on the cluster. And the fourth part is the operator controller, which is the user facing API. So it's as simple as uh, creating a CR. In the CR, you would define the package name, the version, and probably the channel. This is still in progress. So uh, when the operator CR is created, the reconciler for the operator controller will kick in. It will uh, resolve the dependencies using DEPI. It will get in the bundle contents from the catalog D and it will install the contents on the cluster using RACPAC. And this is how the whole system works together. So yeah, this is the architecture which we had in mind, but we are definitely open to suggestions. Uh, we do have uh, milestone one and milestone two out, which is a very basic demonstration on what we are looking forward to and what we are envisioning OLM to be. We definitely welcome you all to try out the demo, to try out uh, things which we have developed and provide us input on whether you like it, whether you don't like it, or if it's something which is breaking your existing uh, scenarios. So we have GitHub repositories for each of these components and we are pretty much kind of active on OLM dev. All our uh, meetings, community meetings happen in there. So please do participate and yeah. The last one, last slide is to provide us feedback on this talk. Any questions? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> hey, here, let me run to you with the mic so you can. 
thanks for the overview. Uh, for if there's somebody out there who's like equally comfortable with Java and Go or something like that, they're trying to decide. Are there any highlights of features uh, of the, the, the Java side that uh, might be interesting or different, uh, or any other context or comparison you could share? Unfortunately, no, because I haven't worked on the Java stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not particularly aware of any any specific features. Um, from what I've heard, their framework is pretty much just a straight re-implementation of controller runtime. So theoretically, everything that's possible with that should be possible in Java. Um, yeah, whatever you want to do. <laughs> Uh, unit tests for what? Unit tests for the operator itself? Again, I'm not entirely clear what you mean. Do you mean, would you be able to write unit tests for the operator itself in Java? No, just, just a general, general question, you know, what is possible with Java? Uh, okay. Uh, yes, you'd be able to write unit tests in Java if you wanted to. And you could use whatever uh, Java frameworks. I know there's a bunch out there if you wanted to, yeah. I mean, if you're talking about unit tests for the operator itself, yes, you can you can write unit tests in pretty much any language. So I'm I'm not really, as long as we're talking about like unit tests for the operator itself, as opposed to like unit tests for the deployed operator. Um, there are unit tests available in Java right now, but um, I don't know if it answers your question in terms of end test. Uh, Java is still looking to develop the entire framework of end test from Go to. Uh, Java. So that's still in progress, but basic unit tests are kind of still available in their repositories, I guess. Uh, anybody else? Oh, coming over here. Um, hi, do you have any um, suggestion on, on how to end-to-end -end test an, an operator like to deploy it, I don't know, from pipeline to a kind or something like that, and then run some so, stuff on it? Uh, we have a tool called Scorecard that already exists that allows you to run uh, integration tests on a deployed operator. Um, it comes baked in, well, not baked in, you have to bake it yourself, but it comes pre-written with a bunch of tests that are like basic reflexive uh, uh, executions of the various API endpoints of the deployed operator. And then it has functionality to write custom tests for your own, you know, you want to test the actual functionality that's unique to your operator. Um, you can generate that using the commands in the operator SDK for scorecard. Uh, and basically what that does is it, it you know, you, you push your operator to the cluster and then you run the scorecard command, it generates the scorecard image, pushes the scorecard image to the cluster and it, it executes against the, the controller pods. Thanks. Yeah, sure. Anyone else? Hi. Um, with the current OLM, it's been challenging to use GitOps to uh, specify we want to install a specific version of an operator and then use GitOps to say, I want to upgrade from this version to, to the next version. I, is the new schema going to help with this? Uh, so the new schema which OLM is going to introduce is in the form of uh, FBC. Uh, so the FBC brings in the JSON content. I think the one of the difficulties you must be facing is through defining the version through SQLite uh, packages. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something which we are working on to bring in and change the entire format through FBC. But again, um, you mentioned about upgrades through GitOps, but what we suggest is OLM's Ruckpack will itself do the upgrade for you. So it will manage the upgrade cycle and in, turns it, uh, in turn it facilitates safer installs. So in the sense you want to upgrade from v1.x uh, to say v2.x and then in, 
you are not sure whether 2.x is going to be successful or not. And OLM is going to provide a safer install in terms of rolling back in case it's not successful. So we kind of suggest to do the upgrades through OLM itself, through the inbuilt uh, reconciler, which we have it in that pack. And uh, thank you. Uh, second question. Um, does the new API also replace the CSV, CSVs, the cluster service versions? Oh, this entire architecture will kind of remove CSV. So we are working towards a CSV-less OLM where you need not have CSV, but the uh, just the manifests of the operator which you want to install. That's the idea of the design right now, but again, it's still in VOC. Thank you. Hey, so just coming back to the scorecards, personally, when I saw the docs, I shied away a bit from it. I was wondering if you talk more about like the benefits over just like env test and you know, what I can get out of it. Uh, well, I know it comes pre-baked in with a bunch of, I mean, relatively simple, but reflexive tests that are just going to make sure like all the endpoints on your controller are working the way they're supposed to. Um, I'm not actually particularly familiar with env test. I've never personally written tests with it, so I can't really say one or the other, um, but I have written custom scorecard tests and it's, I don't know, was fine. It was very portable because it's baked into an image and you can just push the image anywhere. So anywhere, you, you know, you're pulling your operator image from, you can just have the scorecard image live there and it's accessible in whatever cluster you're, you're running stuff on. And so like what, for example, were you testing with these scorecards? Uh, I mean, so the, like I said, the, the baked in tests, tests like, uh, reflexively like just make sure that all your endpoints are operating and the val you know when you submit requests they're validated and stuff like that stuff that's not particularly unique to the function of your specific operator and then you write custom tests on top of those that taste you know when you create a foobar object that the actual stuff that's supposed to exist in the back end comes into existence in the way it's supposed to to test your reconciliation loops and the, sorry, does it do so like creating a custom instance of your resource or uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, you're the one writing the test, so it's going to do that however you want it to. But yeah, probably by actually manipulating the state of the cluster. Cool, thanks. Any, oh, anybody else? Okay, well, I think that's it for today then. Uh, thank you all for coming. If uh, you've got further questions or you just want to chat, feel free to come up and say hello.